I wonder how many of you know right off the top of your head the opening line of the Nicene Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And one of the very best invisible things that God created was science. God created logic, he created mathematics, he created physics, he created science. That's a creation. Our coordinate system is a creation by God. And we have to be grateful for those invisible aspects that God created. Now when God created the laws of physics, as in general relativity, quantum chromodynamics, string theory, whatever you like, he had an incredible thought so far beyond human beings. But he created a universe that was capable of developing a creature who could love God in return. That is a remarkable, beyond remarkable, it's almost you know, unimaginable for human beings. But what happened in, in science, once upon a time in ancient Greek days, Science was this curiosity that was no, nobody understood it. There was nothing coherent. And then across the Middle Ages, science began to organize, to grow, to make sense. Muslim scholars like Averroes and Avicenna, Jewish scholars like Maimonides, and then a long string of Christian scholars, including fabulous astronomers and so forth, over many, many centuries, brought about an advance in science which was God's gift to us to allow us to understand the universe he created. As science grew and progressed, what became dominant was data. Data is what matters. Experimental or observational data, that's what you count on, and that's what's important. And data became the arbiter of scientific truth. That's what matters. Data matters. Theories are wonderful. Theories are mankind's attempt to make sense of the data. That's what you're trying to do when you form a theory. But in the final analysis, data is supreme, and it is data that trumps theory. Now, here's a quote from a famous 20th century physicist named Richard Feynman. Lettering is a little small, but basically what he has to say is this about theory. That no matter how smart you are, where you come from, how good you are, or how elegant your theory is, if it doesn't agree with the data, it is wrong. And that's all there is to it. That's the difference in science between theory and data. So let's look at some actual data. Here you have this wiggly thing that is the temperature. But it isn't really wiggling very much because if you look carefully, that vertical scale is only one degree C. Only one degree C, C is all that noise over the last uh, 18 or so years. And what's the temperature doing? It is flat. It isn't going any place. That's data, scientific data. The gray curve running gradually from lower left to upper right is the increase in carbon dioxide. And it's going up. It has been going up since the beginning of the industrial age, from 280 parts per million up to 400 parts per million today. There is no question that CO2 is increasing, probably because of mankind. But look, those two data sets have nothing to do with each other. You have a temperature that has no trend. You've got carbon dioxide with a very clear trend, and they're not related, and that's data. Here is what is going on with data in theory. The blue line at the bottom is reality. That's your data, that heavy blue line. And behind it, if you could look finely enough into it, you would see little tiny dots there because dots are data. In the meantime, there are all these climate models, 73 of them in this particular example. And they're, every one of them is well above the data. The average is the heavy red arrow in the middle. 
But there is clearly a very obvious discrepancy between data and theory. And that is the thing that tells you, whether it be in Feynman's words or your own, that when it doesn't agree with the data, the theory is wrong. So, as I said, CO2 has increased. The computer models are predicting, as you just saw, that all of this increase in temperature that hasn't come true. It just isn't the case. So what's a real scientist supposed to do? You must build a new theoretical model. The old ones don't work and aren't any good. When God created the universe, it says in the Book of Wisdom that wisdom was at his side, or depending on your translation, that he did it with wisdom. But the wisdom they had is beyond human comprehension because there are these two forms of life, plant and animal, that depend on each other. They use each other's waste to provide food. That is the incredible gift, the cleverness of God, so far beyond mankind, to be able to create such a system. CO2, we breathe it out, fossil fuels burn, it's no good to us, but it's plant food. And it helps keep our planet sustained in a form of two life, two, sorry, two forms of life that work together. Now, this plant food, what happens is carbon dioxide has a very important effect on a plant's leaves. It makes something called the stomata, or openings, a little wider. And as a result, water can be utilized more efficiently. Plants grow in a drier climate, all kinds of good things like that happen. And when plants do grow, you get more trees, you get more grain, you get more food. And therefore, you help and you get more life. And that's the way God designed our system, to make use of CO2 in this brilliant way. All right, the conclusion from the data is terribly clear. There is nothing to fear from carbon dioxide. It doesn't increase the temperature. And if there's no reason to abolish carbon dioxide, then there is no reason to suppress fossil fuels. Thank you very much. Tom, any, any questions for Tom? Yes. I was just very interested because um, Mark Ryan's speech seems to be suggesting that there's a triangle of all that's been faith in science. And your speech, which I found much more interesting and uh, intriguing, is saying that obviously there is a connection. The science is about it trying to understand God's method. Uh, do you agree that there's a discrepancy between your two opinions and uh, what's your view of what Mark Morano has to say about the fact that essentially people of faith have no place uh, understanding science and scientists have no place to understand No, no, no. Go back to the microphone. You have to distinguish between real science, which the church has all, always supported, and the data I showed is real science. Church has supported real science for centuries, okay? But the claims by people about science are not necessarily representative of the real science. And that's the discrepancy you have to be careful of. If I may, um, both Lord Longton and Mark Rano gave examples of where their heretics were burned and murdered um, at the stake precisely because they presented what we now know to be correct science. So they're saying that religion has had a, a, a negative and a, a very destructive effect on the development of science, yet you're saying the very opposite. And I'm just trying to clear up in my own mind uh, which, is, which is more accurate. The failures and mistakes of the past are something that people of all civilization regret very deeply, including the church. And you heard uh, Pope St. John Paul II apologize for the mistakes of the past. But we here today want to make sure there aren't any mistakes made in the future. Yeah. So, how, as a person of faith, how do you feel about that? Mark, you're bringing up 
I'm sorry, if I should put a noise in the background again, please. No problem. How, how do you feel personally about the fact that Lord Malta is bringing up these mistakes of the church in the Vatican City uh, when the Pope when the is speaking to scientists? Do you think that's... He is quoting statements by people like Jeffrey Sachs and, and Ban Ki-moon. He is not talking about the real science. He's, caught, he's quoting what other people are saying about science. That's the, that's the important distinction. Hal, you have a question? Well, you know, we have politicians in the United States calling carbon dioxide pollution. Mm -hmm. Is there any substitute for carbon dioxide that man and plants to build problems? No, no. Carbon dioxide is essential to plant life. And it is a very low, it's a molecule with extremely low energy state. And the only way you get rid of it is through photosynthesis, combining with water, making sugar inside the leaves of plants. And that's the miracle of God's creation of plant life. But there is no exchange, there's no substitute for carbon dioxide. That's, that's what you have. Yes. Did I see a hand up in the back? No. Um, with, the, with the tremendous variety of different views that there are among scientists, not just about climate, but on practically any issue, especially if you look at the history of science in terms of, say, um, Kuhn's, um, the, uh, his book on scientific revolution, I can't remember the fact that it was the structure of scientific mm -hmm. Yes. With the tremendous variety of opinions in science, and a tremendous variety of opinions in religion, even within just one religion, the Roman Catholic Church. How do you feel about those who speak of the science or the religion as if either one were thoroughly monolithic, and to disagree with some people in either science or in religion is to be anti-science or to be anti-religious? I think in both cases, and here I'll stand with Sir John Templeton, we must be humble. That is what God calls on us to do. We know this much about science. It's never fun. We can believe something about science today, and tomorrow it can be destroyed. A century ago, Einstein came along with general relativity and completely undercut the wonderful centuries-old work of Isaac Newton, which was magnificent. But it went away in a couple of years because of some new understanding that Einstein brought. That can happen in science any day. As you mentioned Thomas Kuhn's book, a new paradigm, a new understanding, a new structure can come along tomorrow. But I will again stand with Richard Feynman in saying that no matter how elegant your theory is, if it doesn't agree with the data, it's wrong. So disagreeing with a consensus how we're real or imagined in science doesn't make one anti-science, is that correct? Of course. Science is, stands as something that is real. However many people believe this or that about it, however wonderful a consensus might be, has no bearing on the science itself. And those journalists who would say that you disagree with the consensus, whether it's real or unreal, or not as strong or weak it might be, you are anti-science, those journalists who deal with ignorance of science, is that correct? Now, I would say that there's, there's a lot of limited understanding among many classes of people, and generally, if you're not a scientist, there is a tremendous inertia that causes you to believe what someone else says about science. And that's a, a trap that everyone's liable to fall into. So it's difficult to be uh, critical of such people, but it's better to say, look at the data, understand the science, work a little harder to figure out what's really going on, and then use your God-given human ability to reason to decide what is really the case. And reasoning, understanding science is a whole lot better than joining a consensus because other people said so. If no more questions.